Good morning, church. So good to be with you on this first Sunday of 2024. Um, You know, as I was thinking about our time in God's Word this morning, we had a great year last year studying through the Gospel of Mark. And at the end of this month, we plan to step back into a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study through a book of the Bible. But for the first couple of weeks of this year, we're going to spend a little bit of time focusing on what I would say, God's grand plan. And part of his grand plan is this reality that as a Christian, it really is about a whole new life. The old has passed away, new has come. And there's a book in the New Testament. It's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul first authored to an early church in the city of Ephesus that I think, at least for this morning, it highlights for us that truth, that that being in Christ, being a believer, being born again, surrendering your life to Jesus, is about a whole new life. The book is the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to ask you to grab your Bible or a device, and if you haven't already, to open up to that book. But Someone once shared, the book of Ephesians is a book that teaches us, teaches us how to live as believers, how to be one who's identified by love. And some of the most, I don't know, maybe we can quote Nacho Libre here, the nitty gritty relationships of life, like a husband and wife relationship, a parent child, what it looks like to be under authority in some type of capacity, what it looks like to really be a person of love in those relationships where you're really known and tested. The book of Ephesians highlights what it looks like to look like a new person because of who you are in Christ, what it looks like to be someone who's loving in those relationships, and then also how to fight. How to fight. You say, what do you mean? I thought we're supposed to be people of love. Well, you know and I know if you've walked with the Lord for any length of time, five minutes at least, that the Christian life truly is a battleground, that there's the world system. That, that's totally against kind of this paradigm of life as a new person in Jesus. There's our own flesh that kind of pulls against that which the Spirit desires, and there's an enemy. See, the book of Ephesians, this New Testament letter, it's a book that shows us how to live, how to love, how to fight. But someone else also put it this way, and I kind of tend to gravitate towards this because I've got an addiction that some of you guys are aware of, and it's that addiction of alliteration. But it's this dynamic that in the book of Ephesians, we're shown our wealth in Christ. It's like chapters one through three. This is who you are as a believer. Your position in him. The spiritual blessings and possessions he gives to us as his kids. That in him, we have such spiritual richness. That's part of the book of Ephesians, chapters 1 through 3, our wealth in Christ. And then what does the walk look like as we walk with him throughout life? In those kind of relationships, husband and wife, parent and child, with one another as Christian brothers and sisters. And then chapter 6, the warfare. That there really is this battle, but we're not left without the right tools and equipment to fight this battle. The book of Ephesians. It's kind of this book that's so, so richly centered on how to live this whole new life as a Christian. So for this morning, we're going to take a look at chapter 2. And just a handful of verses, verses 1 through 10, and, and really the theme of this whole chapter is God's work in our lives. We see God's work for us, in us, and through us. And the passage that we'll look at this morning, we'll see how God works on behalf of us, in us, for us, through us. See, it's his spot, if I can put it that way, in our lives. His spot. He's the one working in us. He's the one working through us. He's the one working on us. And I would share with you that his spot is central. You know, kind of with um, so many things or situations in life, 
You've got to know where to stand or how to interact or know your spot in order for things to work as they're intended. What do you mean by that? Let me give you a few silly illustrations from our little life as the Spencers. One of these devices has made its way into our home over the last couple of weeks by my giving this as a gift to one of our children. Are you guys familiar with this? I know some people on the front row who I won't name, they're familiar with it. But this thing is interesting. Anyone ever been on one of these things? You guys are smart people. Not a lot of hands went up. Well, with this device, it's been around for years, but it's new to us. You got to know your spot or you're going to find yourself in a spot that you don't desire. Another piece of equipment, I guess you could call it, that made its way into our home this year is one of these. Anyone familiar with one of these? A couple more hands go up. We won't go into the memes of what it looks like when you don't know your spot or you feel like you're too immersed into that reality. Knowing your spot in something as silly as this, or earlier this year, one of my sons for the first time kind of stepped into baseball. He was in t-ball season. I don't know if you've been to a t-ball game recently, but it is so much fun to watch, especially those first few games as they're trying to figure out, what is this thing sticking up in the ground in the ball? Do I kick it? Do I hit it? Do I, where do I stand? Like Knowing your spot in something, be it a game, be it a relationship, be it a position at work, it's crucial. And this is what I want to share with you. Knowing your spot spiritually has great implications and impact in how you live your life as this new person in Christ. See, if if you fail to remember or if if you kind of lose sight of what God has done, here's the natural thing that'll happen in this new life in Jesus. You'll start to drift into apathy, lose appreciation. Familiarity breeds contempt. If you don't remember, this is who God is. This is his spot. This is what he's done. If you don't recall that, not only may you begin to, I don't know, drift into apathy, but maybe you'll begin to prioritize things in life that really aren't a priority in light of eternal life. See, if you don't know what God is doing even presently in your life, it's easy to feel a little bit lost and to begin then to invest your time, your energy, your effort into things that God isn't. So this morning, if I were to give a a title to our time together in God's Word, I would kind of call it this, Know Your Spot. And we'll organize our time together in God's way through Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 in this way. I'll put it up on the screen. My spot without God. That's going to be verses 1 through 3. And then we're going to see in verses 4 through 9 what God did about the spot that we were in. And then lastly, in verse 10, we're going to see, well, what's my spot now with God? And this week and on into the next couple of weeks... We're going to have insight a little bit into what God is doing now. What God is doing now. Ephesians chapter 2, looking this morning at verses 1 through 10, I'd like to first read from verses 1 through 3 as we consider this theme. My spot without God, this is where I am. Father, I ask and pray as we open your word this morning Lord, that you would speak by your spirit through your word. Lord, Lord, help me to be helpful to your people, to just share your word in a way that is both simple but also true and honest. And Lord, that allows you to speak by your spirit to us, both in an individual way and in a congregational way. Lord, bless this time. May it not be lost on us, but may we engage with your word May you quicken and aliven your word by your spirit in our hearts and in our spirits. And Lord, may we leave this place this morning knowing that we've heard from you, from your word. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, let me read verses 1 through 3. This morning I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Here's what Paul writes to these early, early Christians in Ephesus. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, these three verses show us, highlight to us, illuminate to our hearts our spot before God. One author put it this way. We were doomed, depraved, disobedient, and dead. Welcome to the first Sunday of 2024, right? Like, this is your spot before God. You know, whether you are original to this area, you've moved to this area, maybe you realize that in the South, we have certain delicacies not known to the rest of the world. Fried okra. Does anyone like fried okra? Boiled peanuts? Hush puppies. I like hush puppies. Anything fried? Okay. Cheesy grits, they've kind of made their way around the world. Bacon candy, I think that's something that is really enjoyed in the South. But not only is our food unique, but there are some sayings that you'll hear if you're in the South that are unique. How about this one? I bout fell out. Have you heard this one? <laughs> Fixin'. I think we've all heard that one. Or jeet. This is not like Gen Z jargon. Yeet. The jeet. Do you know what that one is? You guys know it. Did you eat? Like, that's a quick way in the South to communicate. Jeet? No, Jew? You know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> like, we have these sayings, we have these foods, we have these dynamics in the South that are like, okay, that's Southern. Like, that's, that's a whole other world down there, right? Well, as a Christian, we can have certain phrases or words that we may totally get and understand. Others may not have a clue. But listen. The word saved, how many of you have heard that word as a Christian? Yeah, I'm saved. Okay. Often that's a word that's more uttered or heard than often fully understood and embraced. Two times in the passage that we'll see today, this passage kind of unpacks what this means for us as believers. Saved simply means, well, it's kind of a summary of the gospel message. You were dead in sin living in it, headed towards judgment, and God saved you. He rescued you. Your spot before God interacted? Doomed. Depraved. Disobedient. Dead. This was our spot, and this is what God rescued, saved us from. When we save someone, we're saying that someone was in danger, unable, incapable within themselves to do anything to change their situation from a terrible fate, and someone else stepped in and rescued and delivered them. I kind of wrestled whether or not to share this story with you, but I came across kind of a gruesome example of this that really sticks with me. I read about this story of two brothers who kind of spent their summer kind of it was in the state of Missouri, playing, uh, I guess, by an old sandbag levee near the, the Mississippi River that was at one time used to hold back floodwaters. And while they were playing, they found themselves in kind of some quicksand that resulted from a breach from one of the levees. And when the rescue workers finally found them, they found one younger brother just kind of standing in the sand. And when he was asked, where's your brother by the rescuers, he said, I'm standing on his shoulders. Because the older brother had sacrificed his life for his younger. And this is the illustration. Before God, if he doesn't interact, if he doesn't do something on our behalf, we're sinking. We, we need rescue. We need salvation. We need someone other than us who's stronger and mightier and capable to reach in. Why? Because we're lost. We're in great need. And Jesus, kind of like our older brother in that illustration, did what we couldn't and saved us. And in these three verses of Ephesians chapter 2, here's what Paul writes. 
You're saved from sin and death, worldly living, the enemy, Satan, our old nature, and the wrath of God. I don't know if you're on social media or not, but someone sent me a, uh, a message reel this week that, and I'll, I'll just kind of put it in these words. This was the, 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 the thing that he sent me. The gospel of Jesus Christ sounds very strange to a generation that has been taught they are perfect just as they are, that loving themselves is virtuous, that following their heart is the best thing to do, and nothing, nothing is more important than being happy. That's kind of the system of the world and values that we currently have. And so for someone to hear, man, God has rescued, res- what? I mean, my priority is fun, fulfillment. I'm unique. I'm living my truth. That works for you. That doesn't work for me. See, in Jesus, we are saved, rescued from a state that we're in. And that state, it's a bad spot. It's a tight spot. We're saved from death. See, death, first and foremost, is a penalty because of sin. It wasn't God's original intention. It's the byproduct of free will. And death spread to all. But here's the reality. Death is not just a cessation of existence, but death is separation. That's what death is, separation in three ways. There's physical death, when the spirit is separated from the body, There's spiritual death, kind of this dynamic spoken of here in Ephesians chapter 2, like, I don't know if you've ever traveled to the country of Haiti. There was a time, a season in my life from 2005 to 2012 where I was going to Haiti, if not once, at least twice a year, helping a church plant get started and partnering with some of our missionaries. And I'll never forget being there one year as we flew into Pascatawa and then made our trek into port au pay and we were there near Mardi Gras week, which is kind of close to this time of year. And I remember as we were exiting the airport, we saw these, this parade going and these individuals with these massive bull whips that were smacking these whips and these other individuals who they were on the receiving end of this whip were, were walking in a stupor-like state. When I asked our missionary friend, what is happening there? He said, those are zombies. I said, wait a second. That's like video games. That's like entertainment. What do you mean zombies? He said, well, due to either the demonic, drug-induced, or voodoo, that's really what in that culture, when you say Mardi Gras, it's all about the voodoo religion, they walk around in almost a corpse-like state. And what Paul says about spiritual death, that's what it's like apart from Christ. You're dead spiritually, no sensitivity to the Lord. And ultimately, we know there's eternal death. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 refers to those who refuse Jesus, the life-giving gift that he has, who are one day separated from him. And one of my sons this past couple of weeks said, Dad, what is that like to be separated from God? It means you're alone. It means you're in the dark. You're isolated. Hell won't be a place where ACDC is playing and you're with all your buddies. It'll be isolation. Darkness, any good that is in this world is because of God. Remove that, and that is what hell will be. And this is what he says, that's our state before God. That's our spot. He says we're dead in our trespasses in Ephesians. What does that mean to trespass? This is kind of that dynamic of having a two-year-old. Anyone ever met a two-year-old? Well, they make mistakes, true, but then they also trespass sometimes. We say, what do you mean by that? A willful decision to cross the line. Like that's a trespass. Sin means to miss the mark. It's like a it's like an archery or an ar- you know a shooting kind of illustration. Oh, you just didn't hit the bullseye. You missed it. You sinned. But a trespass is this dynamic. There's the line. Well, then I'm going way. And Paul writes, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. One person put it this way. Trespasses speaks of man as a rebel. Sin speaks of man as a failure. And before God, I, you, me, we, that's where we are. That's our spot. 
Nobody, nobody is the perfect fill in the blank. Nobody. Perfect parent, perfect spouse, perfect. No, we all sin. And the half brother of Jesus, James, would put it this way in James chapter 2, verse 10 Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking the whole thing. Here's our spot before God intervenes. We're disobedient, dead. He goes on to say in verses 2 and 3 that we followed the world, followed Satan, followed our own passions. It's like a dog on a leash being led wherever our master goes. And that master is the flesh, the world system, the enemy himself. See, while humans bear the image of God, definitely, and sin hasn't destroyed the image of God completely in humanity, we are radically separated from God because of sin. And this is our spot. And I think what Paul's doing here in Ephesians, it's kind of like, like a black cloth being laid on which a beautiful diamond will sit. And Paul is showing the, the depth of the depravity in order to what? To magnify what he's going to write about in verse 4. The mercy and the grace of God. And he gives what many have called the two sweetest words in all of the Bible. Here they are. But God. Look at verse 4. Let me read verse 4 through verse 9. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. How? By grace. By grace have you been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Doomed, disobedient, depraved, dead. What does God do? He kicks us when we're down. Those stinking sin. No. But God, what does it say there, church, who is rich in his mercy because of his great, what? It rhymes with dove. Because of his love. Because of his love for us, God intervenes. God did something about our spot. He loved us. Doesn't love us just when we go to church or read our Bible or try to be spiritual or actually go a whole day without losing your temper with your kids. He loves you at your worst. In his great love, he showed us mercy. What's mercy? Not getting what you deserve. Well, what do I deserve? He said it. Separation from God. That's what's deserved. Then he gives you grace. What's grace? Getting what you don't deserve. Well, what is that? Forgiveness. God doesn't owe us that, but he gives us that. He gives us a family to be a part of. This is amazing to me that our spot before God is that of separation, distance, enemy of God. And what does he say? What does he do? I want to make you my daughter. I want to make you my son. I want to put you in my family. Not only do I want to forgive, but I want to change your status from someone who's, oh yeah, forgiven, but they're just, you know, not really, they're not really invited to Thanksgiving. No, no, no. You're my family. That's what God's done. He's brought us near. He's given us forgiveness, made us family, and he's given us a future, a future. You know, it would be like my situation with half a dozen children. If there was disobedience, or, okay, here, there, there's an obvious need here for justice, but I'm going to give mercy, right? I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And then I hear the bells of Mr. Softies coming down the cul-de-sac. You know Mr. Softies? And that would be like, okay, here is grace. Get what you want. 
and a very broken way to illustrate that's that kind of dynamic. He doesn't just deal out justice. Here's what you deserve. But he also shows us mercy, doesn't give us what we deserve, and then he gives us grace. Because of his love and because of his son, You see, God doesn't just sweep it under a cosmic rug in his justice because he's perfect and because he's complete. Jesus, that older brother, said, I'll go into the quicksand so that they can stand on my shoulders. That's the justice of God and the love of God perfectly balanced and met. As someone once put it more beautifully than I, at the cross of Jesus Christ is where the justice of God and the love of God kiss at the cross. Well, what does this mercy and grace look like? He makes us alive. Sets, in a, sets us in a place of honor. He saved us. Pastor Warren Wiersbe says this, But God, these words are among the greatest in the Bible. God could have allowed us to go on in sin and live eternally with the devil in hell, but instead he chose to save us, gave us life, raised us from the grave of sin, and took us out of the graveyard. More than that, he made us members of Christ. We've been quickened together, raised together. We sit together in the heavenlies. And God did this because he's rich in mercy and great in love. Mercy means that God doesn't give me what I deserve. Grace means that he gives me what I don't deserve. He gives me what I don't deserve. Can I ask you to do something with me? If you're physically able, can can you stand with me for just a moment? I would like to just read this passage one more time to you. I'm going to put it up on the screen. We're not done with the sermon. Like, man, this is awesome. I love the first Sunday. This guy's done 20 minutes early. We still got a few more. But just out of respect for, for the authority of God's word and what this means, I want us to take in this passage one more time. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. How's all this possible? In Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You may be seated. Our spot before God, separated. What did God do? By his grace, through faith in his son Jesus, he saved us. Faith, trusting in, applying. You just evidenced faith three and a half seconds ago. You know what you did? You rested in your seat. And that's what saving faith looks like. It's not just an academic acknowledgement. Yeah, Jesus is Lord. The demons know that. But to trust in Jesus is to let yourself just rest in him. Put all of your trust, the weight of your hope and expectation in him. That's saving faith. Jesus is the one that does the saving and the securing. That's his spot. We trust in him. And it has nothing to do with being good enough or earning a spot. And that's kind of our third and final point this morning. It's my spot with God. What is God doing now? Let me read it one more time. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Can you say those three words with me one time? For good works. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, we're his workmanship. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are a new creation in him. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, He's faithful for he who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And this word workmanship, it carries this idea of masterpiece. The word is poema, which we get our word poem. It's a work of art. God is creating something in you and writing your story that is masterfully unique and beautiful. And he has good works for us to do. He doesn't save us to shelve us, right? Okay, you're saved. Now just kind of wait for my return. No. He saves us so that we might carry out good works. And I believe he has specific ones in mind. Good works that we should walk in. See, here's our spot right now as believers. I'll put it up on the screen. We're not saved by, but saved for good works. That's what life looks like right now as a believer in Christ Jesus. That's how life looks radically new and different as one who's a believer than one who isn't. This is part of the purpose of God that he has for us as his kids to do good works. What does that look like? It can be as simple as helping others. Helping others. The amazing and wonderful truth about God's purpose for our lives is that he has good works that Mary should walk in, that Neil should walk in, that Julie should walk in. He's already scheduled the days and and events of our lives with opportunities to tangibly share his love with others. Let me read to you a psalm, Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, that my soul knows very well. My frame is not hidden from you, from when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, for your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And listen to this. And in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me. When as yet there were none of them. God has good works, and that includes January 7th, 2024, a day scheduled. See, the next time you see a a neighbor in trouble, a friend navigating an issue, a coworker who needs help, someone you don't even know, that's an opportunity that God has placed in your path. Listen to the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So this is what Jesus says. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your, here's that same word again, good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. You see, my spot, our spot, without God, completely separated. But what did God do about our spot? He loved us, made us alive, saved us. And it speaks of this dynamic in Ephesians 2 that he's honored us and exalted us. And that's both now and it's also coming. And our spot now with God, what God is doing now, he's working. 2 Corinthians 5, he's he's made us a new creation. Philippians chapter 2, he's going to complete that work that he started in you. And he has good works that we should walk in. You see, this is what God is doing right now with your life and mine as individuals. He has rescued and saved us. He's positioned us as part of his family, given us a future, given us forgiveness, given us freedom over sin. But he also, as the author in Psalm would write, he's got your days logged. He knows what he has for you. Good works that you should walk in. But God is that perfect gentleman where he will not force himself upon you 
I don't understand all this in Scripture and the mind of God. I only know what you know, what's in the Bible, right? But there's this powerful, mysterious thing where God allows us to step into opportunities with him and watch him work or to not. Or to not. And I want to encourage you that your spot as a believer in this brand new year is to walk with him, like Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, in such a way that your light shines, that, that people see good works and they don't say, oh, isn't he, isn't she just... No, they see good works and go, there's a God, because that person is doing good works, right? The glory goes to him. It's done in such a way where it points to him. The reality that God is forgiving and gracious and kind and it's tangibly seen by you and I just stepping into good works. Not saved by them, but listen, don't miss this. You'll drift into apathy as a Christian if you don't embrace this, but you're called to them. You're called to them. God has a purpose and a plan for your life even on January 7th, 2024, right where you are today that you'd step into good works that he places before you. And the tone of that text is not meant to give you a, a riddled sense of anxiety. Well, what are those good works? How do I find them? How, where, where, where? No, no, no. Psalm 139, he formed me. He knows what those are. As he places opportunities before you, step into them. You know, I recently bought a black and gray plaid shirt. And you know what I've realized? Since I bought this shirt, there's a lot of other people that bought it too. <laughs> Say, how do I know that? Because I'm looking for it. What do you mean by that? God has good works for you today to walk in. If you'll start to look for them, you'll see them. And recognize, there were a lot of people with this shirt before I even knew that. Before I even bought it. But now that I'm looking for it, I see it. In Ephesians chapter 2, the book of Ephesians as a whole... It's this beautiful letter written by a guy that dearly loves brothers and sisters in the city of Ephesus. And he's teaching them, sharing with them, showing them how to walk out this life as a brand new person. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he highlights these three things. Here's the spot that we're all in, unless God does something. And here's what he did. He intervened through his son, Jesus. But God, verse 4, he saved us by his grace, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And what is he doing now? He's giving you opportunities in your life for your life to have meaningful purpose. Purpose that has both temporal and eternal significance. And I want to encourage you to look for the black and gray shirt. Does that make sense? Not, not, don't wear the same thing. That's not what I'm saying. Look for those good works. They're there, those opportunities for you to step in and to show and to share the love of God and his son Jesus in such a way that, that God gets the glory. And that, and I truly believe, is what gives meaning and purpose to these days on earth. You can spend your life acquiring experiencing, getting, and find that to be rocks in the Grand Canyon trying to fill it up. It just never works. Or you can look for the good works that God has for you and step into those and find so much more fulfillment in following him and doing the good works that he has for you than any other goals or aspirations you may set yourself. Here's what I'm trying to say. God loves you. He does truly have a plan for your life. And part of that plan includes, at this spot in your life right now, walking with him in the good works he's placed before you. That, that's very true on an individual level, on a congregational level. That's what God is doing now. And to kind of stay within that theme of thought for the next couple of weeks... We're going to consider also what God is doing on a global level. 
For the next two weeks, Pastor John is going to be sharing kind of a two-part series. And it's going to kind of center on this dynamic of, of Israel and the prophecies related to Israel and God's timetable and what's currently going on in the Middle East and our world seen as a whole. But today, we've really considered kind of the heart of God through the gospel. And I know no better way than to do what we're going to do in just a few moments to celebrate that than to take communion.